again with another edition of Patients on the News. This one harkens back to the very beginning of the time when we started this program. I think it was 17 years ago or almost 17 years ago. And it was just Patients on the News and I would read an article in a newspaper, some newspaper or several newspapers and comment on them. And then we took calls and so forth. Uh, and then we went to a, another format, which was interviewing what I hope have been interesting people. And uh, I had intended to do that tonight. Uh, I had been reading about uh, all of the um, the discussion, letters to the editor, and complaints about Shanna Bellows and how she just decided on her own to bar Trump from the ballot in Maine and how terrible it was and so forth, and that the Republicans, uh, pretty much all of them in the Maine legislature, uh, had decided to impeach Shanna Bellows for her crimes. And... Um, or misdemeanors, uh, which are crimes. And uh, I called or had somebody call Representative Andrews from South Paris, who I was told is a very articulate, uh, intelligent guy and would be a good guest to talk about uh, this, this movement to impeach Shanna Bellows, which apparently he's the leader of. And he's the fellow who submitted the legislative request to create a committee to investigate her. But Representative Andrews was not interested in coming in and answering questions. So I thought what I would do is, because I don't have a guest, a guest wouldn't come, uh, and I suspect a lot of Republicans would have, been refu would have refused to come. That reminds me, there are some Republicans that like this format. You know, they're not not sign sound bites. We have no sound bites. It's 60 minutes of Q&A. So uh, you get to the bottom of things. There are follow-up uh, questions. I've had many, many more conservatives on this show in the 17 years than I've had liberals or Democrats. I've had mostly uh, conservatives or mostly Republicans, and they've all been very good. I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, I wanted to interview Paul LePage when he was governor. And uh, I called, and they said, well, we'll think about it, and they didn't get back. In the meantime, there was a woman, a very nice lady, who had uh, been appointed uh, to the Board of Education in Maine, uh, the Maine Education Department Oversight Group. And uh, the the Democrats in the Senate were against her, and they voted against her, and she didn't get confirmed. And I thought it was a travesty. And so I called her up. I didn't know her. And she came on, and she's very conservative. And, you know, I agreed with much of what she had to say. And I thought the Democrats were terrible in turning her down, just because they didn't like what she had to say. I actually like some of what she had to say. So she came on, and she appreciated the fact that as she put it, I was even-handed. So when I called the page, I get no answer back. I called her, and she called the page, and she said, go on. And he did. And when we finished, we did it up uh, in the Capitol at his office. And when we finished, and my producer, who's here in the room, she'll remember this, he looked at me, and he said, any time you want to interview, you me, interview me, you call me up. And uh, I did, actually, when he was running against uh, the governor uh, uh, last year. Uh, I did call him up and said, why don't you come on again? And he did. And uh, I like him. I disagree with him on most everything. But he's an honest man. He, unlike Trump, uh, Trump doesn't believe in every, anything. He's just conning people, trying to say things to get the base riled up and everything. Paul LePage was not into that. Paul LePage believed in everything he said. Paul LePage had principles. I didn't agree with many of his principles, for, sh for sure. But he believed them, and he was in it because he believed what he was doing, and he wanted to change things in accordance with what he believed. Biden only wants to be elected. He wants power. 
and there's a big, I mean Biden, uh, Trump, he wants power. And there's a big difference between Paul LePage and Joe Biden. But that's uh, down a side street now. Um, these people wanted to impeach her, and so I decided I wanted to talk about it. And I got really on to this when I read three letters to the editor um, that were written in the last week or two that express the views, I'll call them, of the Trumpers uh, on this whole thing. And here was the first one. It kind of stirred me up. It said, uh, this was written by a woman named Catherine Farrell. It appeared in the Portland Press Herald. And it starts, who does the main Secretary of State Bellows think she is? By whose authority is she removing John L. J. Trump from the ballot? It is unconstitutional at best, and not to mention election interference. We, the people of Maine, will vote for whomever we want. She calls Bellow's decision 31 pages of blather. And uh, so I, that made me think, well, this woman does have no, no idea what she's talking about. None. But people share her opinion. I've heard them. They share her opinion, and they don't know what they're talking about. So I said, well, look, Patience, why not go on the program and talk a little bit about Bellow's decision and show that these people have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, by whose authority is she removing Donald J. Trump? I thought, well, let's talk about the authority for moving, removing Donald J. Trump. Uh, another one, probably the next day, Bellow's actions should not be tolerated. I just read that Maine Secretary of State is taking Trump's name off our presidential ballot. This is not democracy or the actions that should be tolerated by a free people, says William Tappan of Elliott. And then he goes on uh, to say that she had no right to do this. Uh, are we being, this, this writer, Mr. Tappan, says, are we being ruled under law or just ruled without law? by officials who choose not to abide by the law. So that reinforced what I was going to do. Maybe we ought to talk about the law that apparently these letter writers are totally unfamiliar with and haven't bothered to check. So uh, that did it. Finally, I said there was one letter writer that uh, wrote a letter after this, and I thought it was thoughtful because this letter writer, he's upset about it too, and he says uh, that uh, the decisions in, in Colorado, by the Colorado Supreme Court, and by the Maine Secretary of State, uh, uh, are begging for challenges. Because they said the problem is that the 14th Amendment does not explicitly establish a process to enforce those provisions, and there is no precedent on which to base a process. And so he goes on to say there's got to be due process and uh, that, uh, it, it, for a jury to find him guilty of insurrection and declare that he is thereby prohibited from holding office. Well, he's getting closer to it, but I still, I, I know that people need to understand what the law is. Why did Shanna Bellows even get into this? And I think it's a question that uh, the first writer uh, uh, get you know raises. What business is it of hers to bar him from the ballot? Well, here's what Maine law says, and unlike the writer of the letter, Maine law is what guides Jenna Bellows. Uh, you know whether you agree with her or not. The question is whether she followed the law. What she required by the law to do. So I'm going to read from Section 336 of Title 21A of the Maine Statutes. This is the law of Maine. First, it says, 
every candidate uh, had, must file a so-called written consent. The written consent of each candidate must be filed either with that candidate's primary petition or at any earlier time during which they collect signatures to get on the ballot. And, the, and Section 336 goes on to say the consent, talking about the written consent, must contain a declaration of the candidate's place of residence, party designation, what political party, if any, they belong to, and a statement that the candidate meets the, quote, qualifications of the office the candidate seeks, which the candidate must verify by oath or affirmation before a notary public or other person authorized by law to administer oaths and or affirmations that the declaration is true that they uh, meet the qualifications of the office they seek. And then the next sentence says, if pursuant to the challenge procedures in section 337, we're going to get to that in a minute, people can challenge the statement submitted under oath. If any part of the declaration is found to be false by the Secretary of State, the consent and the primary petition are void. Can't get on the ballot. That's what the law says. If you're the Secretary of State, you can't say, oh, I don't feel like doing this. So here's what happens. People can challenge it. And if the people challenge it, the Secretary of State cannot ignore it. Here are the rules. Here's the law, Section 337 of Title 21A of the Maine Revised Statutes. Only a registered voter residing in the electoral division of the candidate concerned may file a challenge. And that, in this case, with a presidential challenge, you have to live in Maine. Uh, the challenge must be in writing and must set forth the reason for the challenge, okay? Within seven days, says the law of Maine, after the final date for filing challenges and after due notice of a hearing, the, candid, uh, the Secretary of State shall, not if she feels like it, she must, under the law, hold a public hearing on any challenge properly filed. She has to do it. The challenger has the burden of proving sufficient evidence to invalidate the petitions or the, the ballot request. The next section of Maine law says the Secretary of State shall rule, shall, shall, shall rule on the validity of any challenge within five days after the completion of the hearing. So uh, that, of course, is the answer uh, to the lady that says, by what right? By whose authority? Well, this will come as a surprise to that lady. The Secretary of State has a duty to follow the law, and I'm now reading verbatim, word for word, from the laws of the state of Maine. So Secretary of State had to have a hearing. She had the hearing. The law says that she has no more than five days after the hearing until she, uh, before she issues uh, her decision. And it further says, uh, people talking about what about due process, where do we, you know, how come no courts are involved, how does she get all of this power? She didn't have this power alone. The statute says a, a candidate may appeal the decision of the Secretary of State by commencing an action in superior court this action must be conducted in accordance with the main rules of civil procedure. 
the rules that apply to trials. This is without a jury, but it's a trial. This action must be convinced, con, uh, commenced, that is, the action challenging, a court challenge to the Secretary of State, within five days of the date she issues an order. So she knew that this would go to a court, and it says that the court shall issue a written decision containing its findings of fact. People te give testimony. Evidence is presented to the court. It required by this statute and conclusions of law. And if a candidate, for instance, Donald Trump, after presenting the evidence to the superior court, doesn't agree with what the main superior court says, then this statute goes on to say, an aggrieved party, in this case maybe Trump, may appeal the decision of the superior court, but just on questions of law. This, the law court, the Supreme main Supreme Court, that would get the ultimate appeal here, deals with the law. Is there a lawful basis for the decision of the superior court, and it's the superior court that takes the evidence, the facts, and makes findings of facts, and they have to do it in writing. They have to say, here's what we found the evidence substantiates. They have to do that. The law requires it. Secretary of State abided by this, knows what this process is. The people writing letters, and I must say, the 60 Republicans who voted to impeach her for this, they should read this too. They should read it before they file a, uh, 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 file for a resolution, adoption of a resolution to impeach her. So this is important. There will be an opportunity to present evidence to a court to suspend to support what those, the challengers, are saying. And there will be a decision made. And even that decision can be appealed, and will be, if it's the wrong one for Trump, appeal to the main, uh, uh, the, the main Supreme Court. And incidentally, this time is all compressed. Within five days of the date she made her decision, well, within five days of the challenge, she had to have a hearing. Within seven days after filing the ch ch challenge, she had to hold a public hearing. Within five days after the completion of the hearing, she, she had to come out with a written decision. And within five days of that written decision, Trump had the right to appeal and was essentially this tells him to appeal. And then within 20 days of the decision of the, of the Secretary of State, the Superior Court must rule on those facts. And then three days later, an appeal must be filed with the main Supreme Court, all compressed, all designed to provide due process carefully designed to provide due process, by who? By the legislature. They're the people who enacted this law. The same body, now represented by the 60, 60 Republicans, who want to impeach the Secretary of State for following the rules adopted by their legislature. Figure that one out. Figure that one out. Very hard. Politics is confusing these days. So that's what that says. So she had a hearing. And, uh, and she issued a decision, written decision, available online 
34 pages long, if any are interested in reading it. I can't believe that any of those 60 Republicans read it because they raise issues that are answered in here. So let, let, let's talk a bit about her decision. First of all, she gives a little procedural history going back to the statute that requires a certain procedure. So she, she explains how she followed this statutory procedure. And uh, she talks about the challengers. And she says there are three different challenge, challenges, but the third challenge is from a group, three people. The third challenge is from Kimberly Rosen, a registered voter of Bucksport and former Republican state senator. The second person is Thomas Saviello, a registered voter of Wilton and a former Republican state senator. And the third is Ethan Strimling, who we all know around here is no Republican. But two out of the three are Repu former Republican state senators. These 60 Republicans claim that the, that the Secretary of State was biased. The only way that she could find, as she did, to make the determination she did, was to be biased. Against who? Biased against the two Republican state senators, I guess. They say she's biased because she's a Democrat. Yet she found for two prominent former state Republican senators. See, none of, the, none of what they're saying makes sense. These are facts, and important facts, that they won't tell you about. So uh, she says, she goes on to say that she issued a notice of hearing on December 11th that the parties exchanged exhibit and witness lists. This was an administrative procedure under the Maine Administrative Procedure Act, which talks about witnesses, evidence, and so forth. Uh, and uh, among the witnesses, incidentally, was uh, a professor, Gerald Magliocha, a law professor at Indiana University School of Law. And she goes on to say, Mr. Trump called no witnesses. But these three, these two Republican and one Democratic senator, they had a witness, came from the University of Indiana School of Law. Pretty conservative guy. He's the guy that the Republicans liked when he said that Obamacare was unconstitutional. Then they thought he was a smart guy. So Magliocha testified. So then she said she set a deadline for briefing. They had briefings. They, had, they could present witnesses, evidence, exhibits. So uh, she goes through this, and she says, and I followed all of the legal requirements, which she did. Nobody can deny that. Uh, and she talks about the evidence that came in. And a lot of the evidence was evidence sworn sworn evidence taken by the January 6th committee in Washington. That's evidence taken under penalty of perjury. And it's evidence that no one yet has quarreled about. Nobody said anything, and they were, all of them were former w witnesses, were basically Republicans who worked in the White House with Trump or cabinet members that worked in the Trump administration. That's who testified in the January 6th proceeding. Those are the people. They testified under oath on a penalty of perjury. So that evidence was used in this administrative proceeding with the main secretary of state. Is that proper? The main rules of evidence, section 9057 of Title 21A, talks about administrative proceedings and what is proper and how they're to be conducted. It sets the rules. The legislature did this. 
by adopting. This is Maine law. And it directs, quote, evidence shall be admitted if it is the kind of evidence upon which reasonable persons are accustomed to rely in the conduct of serious affairs. That's right out of the statute. So then the question becomes, was this evidence that the three former state senators put forth evidence that that of uh, uh, that of, of which reasonable persons are accustomed to rely sworn evidence before a congressional committee i think it qualifies i'd be interested in the in the argument and i'm open to it that it doesn't meet that standard so uh all of this was challenged by Trump's lawyers, and uh, Mr. Trump, through his lawyers, did challenge the, the evidence that came in the form of the final report of the Congressional Committee and its citations to, to specific witnesses. Uh, he says that the, 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 Trump objects because he says uh, if the, the report includes hearsay, irrelevant facts, or lacks foundation to automatically render it admissible. That's not true. Because we already have the standard domain, a main law that sets the standard for the evidence. Uh, so then she says that... Um, She did exclude certain evidence that she thought was irrelevant. Certain of the Rosen, so-called Rosen ex exhibits, which are the exhibits that the three senators uh, put in. And then she starts to quote some authorities. She talks a little, she, she, she talks about the, the uh, 14th Amendment, Section 3, and... Uh, but before she gets there, she says, well, the question is, do I have this authority? Well, yes, the statute says I do. But isn't it interesting that a state secretary of state, she says, would have this when this is a presidential election? And we're now talking about a state secretary of state keeping a presidential candidate off the ballot. So she quotes a case a United States Court of Appeals case uh, about how, sta how, how, how secretaries of state can, how states can establish a process to affect presidential candidates. And she says, as Justice Gorsuch, a Supreme Court justice now, today, we know, appointed by Trump, observed in Hassam v. Colorado, Back in 2012, quote, and this is Justice Gorsuch's language, a state's legitimate interest in protecting the integrity and practical functioning of the political process permits it to exclude from the ballot candidates who are constitutionally prohibited from assuming office. So... Letter writers, Maine Republican legislators, you got a complaint with Justice Gorsuch. He's a guy that you would disagree with vehemently on this issue. One other thing about about uh, due process. You remember I told you that the statute, the main statute says that the Superior Court shall take evidence and make findings of fact. That's a state remedy. In other words, this, this goes, th th this wouldn't go to the Supreme Court without these other processes being fulfilled. Because the Supreme Court would say, hey, don't come to us 
because we only decide matters of law, you've got to exhaust your state remedies first. And the state remedies are in Section 337 that I just discussed with you. So um, <clears throat> another point that the Secretary of State makes in her decision is about due process is that Mr. Trump has had the opportunity to present evidence, <clears throat> to call witnesses, to cross-examine, all within the purview of the main Administrative Procedure Act, to argue at length both the light legal and factual issues germane to my decision. And while the timeline of these proceedings has by necessity been compressed, because the statute requires it to be compressed, this is hardly the first time that Mr. Trump or his attorney from Colorado, Attorney Gressler, who, who made his appearance here in Maine on this case, this is hardly the first time they have <coughs> confronted the applicability of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. They've been dealing with it. It is not, likewise, it is not the first time that Mr. Trump has had to grapple with whether the evidence presented here, which it almost directly mirrors that which was offered in the Colorado case, demonstrates that he engaged in insurrection. It's the same case he litigated in Colorado. And as she points out, and what I pointed out about the statute, and he has the opportunity to appeal my decision and providing him with additional process in the Superior Court and the Law Court. What do you think of that, 60 Republican legislators? Is that due process? That's what the courts say due process is. So, what you can disagree with is whether the evidence she review, reviewed adds up to insurrection or, as the 14th Amendment Section 3 says, um, aiding or giving comfort to those who conduct an insurrection. It's one of the two. You don't have to be out front with a sword leading the insurrection. What's enough, said the people who adopted, the people of the United States who adopted the 14th Amendment back in, I think it was 1867, what, what you need, if you don't show them out front with a sword or with a pistol on the scene, did they give aid or comfort to the insurrectionists. So here's what Shanna Bellows says in her written findings, that the parties, Trump and the three former state senators, do not meaningfully dispute the events of January 6th. Multiple government reports that the Rosen challengers, that's the three state senators, entered into evidence confirm a large group of people violently attacked the Capitol with the intent of preventing the certification of a presidential election. Very few people in our country dispute that. There are a few nuts who do, but otherwise that's undisputed. That happens, and that's why they were there, to stop the steel. So there was a lockdown of the Capitol complex, an evacuation of the Capitol, and a United States, she says, and she, this was part of her evidence, a United States government accountability report said the following. Over the course of about seven hours, more than 2,000 protesters entered the United States Capitol on January 6, disrupting the peaceful transfer of power and threatening the safety of the Vice President and members of Congress. The attack resulted in assaults on at least 174 police officers. These events led to seven deaths and caused almost three billion, uh, three billion in estimated costs. So that's what she relied on. And whether you would have made the same decision relying on that evidence as she did, that's debatable. You might not have. And that's, you know, if the 60 Republicans in the 
state legislature had said, uh, yeah, well, she did what she was required to do by law, but we don't agree that the evidence before her sustains a finding that there, there was an insurrection or aid or comfort to an insurrection. So um, that's, you know, the basis of this. Um, Liz Cheney was there. She was the third ranking Republican in the U.S. House of Representatives when all this happened. She was on the floor. She was in every Republican leadership meeting prior to, during, and for months until they threw her out afterwards. She was there. She observed it. She bravely agreed to be, be a, a member of the commission that investigated it. She was there for all the evidence. This book I find fascinating only, be, it, you, it's fascinating only if you are interested in facts. If you say, I don't want anything to do with Liz Cheney, she turned on Trump. She turned on Republicans. I, I, I wouldn't read a word that she said. Fine, but it's chock full of facts in case you ever get around to being interested in facts. It's a resource. And, you know, um, she wrote about her, her father being vice president. And she says at the beginning of this, uh, at the beginning, uh, early on in her book, she talks about um, the oath of office and peaceful transfer of power. And she points out that her father and mother, along with her and her sister, were invited by Al Gore to the vice president's house after the Supreme Court of the United States had said ruled that George W. Bush had won. And she said he had just conceded, and she quotes his concession speech. She, there isn't a single public policy thing that Al Gore stood for that Liz Cheney would agree with. Not a one. But she says, she quotes him, and here's what Gore said in his concession speech. Almost a century and a half ago, Senator Stephen Douglas, Lincoln's opponent, told Abraham Lincoln, who had just defeated him for the presidency, quote, this is Lincoln's words, partisan feeling must yield to patriotism. I'm with you, Mr. President, and God bless you, he said to Lincoln, who had defeated him. And Al Gore goes on to say in his concession speech, well, in that same spirit, I say to President-elect Bush that what remains of partisan rancor must now be put aside, and may God bless his stewardship of this country. Resolved, says George, it says uh, uh, the, the, the then sitting vice president, Resolved, it must be resolved through the honored institutions of our democracy. That's how we decide these elections. The honored institutions of our democracy. And that's what he meant. It had to go to the Supreme Court, an honored institution of our democracy, in order to resolve it. And he finally went on and said, I know many of my supporters are disappointed. I am too, but our disappointments must be overcome by love of country. That's the way it's supposed to be done, folks. You can love Donald Trump all you want, and many do, for a variety of reasons. I would say editorial, most of them psychological, but they do love him. And, uh, but this is the way it was done. 
So she says in her book, Liz Cheney, by any measure, the presidential election in 2000 had been far closer than the 2020 contest. President George Bush's victory in 2000 had ultimately, this is the vice president, her father won the vice presidency, had ultimately come down to just over 500 votes in Florida with a razor thin electoral college margin of 271 to 266, five electoral votes. By contrast, Donald Trump lost in 2020 by more than 70 electoral votes. His nationwide popular vote deficit of 7 million, it's a big difference from 500, of 7 million represented a 5% gap, not even close. Trump would have needed tens of thousands more votes across at least three different states to reverse his electoral college loss. So that's what she tells us early on in this book. And then she, because she witnessed everything, she was there, she saw it. She listened to all of the evidence at the hearing. She was in all of the meetings with the Republicans. She talks about right after the insurrection, about, she quotes uh, Minority Leader McCarthy. She quotes him. She quotes other leaders who were appalled by what happened, who were appalled with Trump. She quotes them directly, criticizing Trump. Some who said he's responsible for this. He, he called them to Washington and he incited them and he sent them to the Capitol. Not one of them has ever said Liz Cheney's book is wrong. She doesn't tell the truth. She misquotes me. No accusations of misquote. Zero. And it's throughout this book. Throughout it. Uh, you would take a look at, just go on the internet and look up at what Republicans, honest, straightforward Republicans, of which most Republicans are, except when it comes to Donald Trump, of what Republicans said. Here's John Boehner. I just pull this off the internet. I once said, says John Boehner, the party of Lincoln and Reagan is off taking a nap. The nap has become a nightmare for our nation. The GOP must awaken. The invasion of our capital by a mob, incited by lies from people entrusted with power, is a disgrace to all who sacrifice to build our republic. I, I, I saved that because I thought it really captured everything. So, was Shanna Bellows, you disagree with her? You say now she didn't have a basis for finding an insurrection. You can debate it. The one thing I would say is that it's all recorded. Everything's on video these days. Back in 1865 when the Civil War ended, nothing was in video. Nothing was even recorded. There were no recording devices. Today, everything is. So the case can be decided by anyone, any one of you, any person in this country, any one of those 60 Republican legislators, anybody. Just look at the, at the videos. Look at the tapes. Read Trump's tweets. Read the testimony. Read the testimony. Given under oath. And then decide. But we all have the evidence. Every, there, is no, there are no secrets. There are some secrets. Uh, every associate of Donald Trump who spoke to him during the time prior to, just prior to January 6th 
and during January 6, was subpoenaed by the Congressional Committee to testify. They wouldn't come. Five of them absolutely refused. They were close to Trump. They talked to Trump many times. There was evidence they talked to Trump on the 5th and 6th of January 2021, and they just ignored the subpoena. One of them was Bannon. Bannon got convicted of something unrelated to Trump, of a fraud, and Trump pardoned him, as he will, he, he pardons every crony of his. Anybody who's for pump, Trump gets a pardon, and they know it. And they all got pardons. So, but in Bannon's case and some of the others, it was cited by the Committee for Contempt. It was, he was prosecuted for contempt. Bannon was convicted of contempt of Congress. He's awaiting sentencing. He's going to go to prison for it, and maybe a couple other people too. Others, like General Flynn and others who talked to Trump around January 5th and 6th, they, they actually showed up, and they testified, and they all said the same thing. I refuse to answer the question because the, uh, uh, pursuant to the Fifth Amendment, be, because the answer may tend to incriminate me. A whole bunch of them. They showed up. And that's what they said. I will not answer about the, your question about what I talked with Donald Trump about during January 5th and 6th because it may, it may incriminate me and I have a Fifth Amendment right not to answer. Now, if this was Donald Trump sitting here, he would say what he said many times. Anybody who takes the fifth is guilty. And what they, what they didn't want to disclose, what they didn't want to disclose is what they discussed with Donald Trump, protecting him, protecting him. So make up your own mind, but it's all there in video. Use common sense. Common sense is the answer with this issue. Me, I hope somehow the Supreme Court uh, finds a way to say he can be on the ballot. Let me ask, let me say who started this. Who started this business about the 14th Amendment, Section 3, prohibiting Donald Trump from being on the ballot. Democrats? No. It all started with two law professors, both of them members of the Conservative Federalist Society. One at the University of Pennsylvania, the other at the University of Chicago. And they're constitutional scholars, and they know the Constitution. That's all they deal with. Their lives are dedicated to understanding the Constitution and writing about it. And they came up with this. I mean, they said, this is perfectly obvious. We've been thinking about this for a long time. What about this provision in the 14th Amendment? What's it mean? And along came this case with Trump. And they said, this is what it means. So they wrote a law review article. They are what's called originalists. They are devotees of Antonin Scalia, the late Supreme Court justice, conservative, who said, you just got to read the simple text of the Constitution in order to decide what it says. It's if it's clear, it's clear. And a look at history to give you context. So these two professors said it's clear what it says. It's clear. And we read the text, and we actually search the history to determine what the context was. We have no doubt that he is not qualified, pursuant to 14th Amendment, Section 3, to be on a ballot for president. That's no Democrat's fault. That's not my fault. That's not anybody's. They decided to do it. Well, it caught on, particularly with originalists. And so it, it caught on with another devotee, in fact, 
a, a guy who was mentored by Antonin Scalia and was his law clerk, J. Michael Luddig, retired United States Court of Appeals from the Fourth Circuit judge, very conservative, was the law clerk to Scalia, worked in the George H.W. Bush White House after clerking for Scalia, and then got moved ahead by the Republicans because he's a very bright guy and they liked what he believed in, and he put him on the United States Court of Appeals. George W. Bush put him on the United States... Oh, excuse me, George H.W. Bush put him on the United States Court of Appeals. He's retired now. He's an originalist. He's right with these guys, and he goes around on talk shows. And what did he say about the Colorado decision? Unassailable. Look it up. Go online. Look up. Judge Michael L uh, uh, Luddig, unassailable. He's a serious guy and a serious Republican. He's not biased against Republicans. He's not biased. Just the opposite. Finally, I'm going to read you something written just last week in the New York Times. And I'm going to read it. We've got just enough time for me to read it. I hope I finish in time. David French. He's an op-ed page guy. He's a Republican. Conservative. Look him up so you know who it is. You don't have to say, listen to what I say about David French. But I like him. He's conservative. He's very rational. He says it's been two and a half weeks since the Colorado Supreme Court ruled that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment disqualifies Donald Trump from holding the office of President of the United States. And I spent way too much of my holiday vacation reading the legal and political commentary around the decision. As I did so, I find myself experiencing deja vu. Deja vu. Since the rise of Trump, he and his movement, and it is a movement, have transgressed the constitutional, legal, and moral boundaries at will. And I think that's what really affects Trench, French, who's very religious, transgressing the moral boundaries. Uh, when Americans attempt to impose, then when Americans attempt to impose consequences for those transgressions, Trump's defenders and critics alike caution the consequences will be dangerous or destabilizing. Don't do it because they'll be in the streets. His followers will be in the streets. There is already a surge in violent threats against the justices of the Colorado Supreme Court. Ian Basson, a Project Democracy co-founder, has suggested, and I agree, that even legal analysis of the 14th Amendment is being colored by the analyst fear of how Trump and his supporters would react to an adverse ruling. This is where we are and have now been for years. The Trump movement commits threats, violence, and lies, and then it tries to escape accountability for those acts through more threats, more violence, more lies. At the heart of the, quote, but the consequences, end quote, argument against disqualification is a confession that if we hold Trump accountable for his fomenting violence on January 6th, he might foment additional violence. Enough, says French. It's time to apply the plain language. He's an originalist too. The plain language of the Constitution to Trump's actions and remove him from the ballot without fear of the consequences. Republics are not maintained by cowardice. To understand the necessity of removing Trump, let's go first to the relevant language from the 14th Amendment. Quote, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president or vice president or hold any office or hold any office civil, military, under the United States. If you've taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, to support the Constitution of the United States 
and shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion or, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. You don't, says French, have to be a lawyer to comprehend those words. You simply need some basic familiarity with American civics, the English language, and a couple of common sense rules of thumb. So read the language, he says. It's simple. And he says, now what's the Supreme Court going to do? The Supreme Court is, you know, they're good lawyers. They're good lawyers. And there are many of them, the conservatives, are originalists. They're people that say, go to the language that the two law professors are saying, that Luddig is saying, you have to, you have to base your decision on. And he says, are they afraid to make the right decision? Well, he said they, the Supreme Court made very unpopular decisions in Brown versus Board of Education, integrating education in the United States. This last decision they made on abortion, that wasn't popular. Fear of negative response cannot and must not cause the Supreme Court to turn its back on the plain text of the Constitution, especially when we're now facing the very crisis the amendment was intended to combat. Republicans are rightly proud of their Civil War history. The party of Lincoln, as it was known, helped save the Union, and it was the party of Lincoln that passed the 14th Amendment and ratified it in state houses across the land. The wisdom of the old Republican Party should now save us from the fecklessness, fecklessness and sedition of the new. Thank you very, very much.